It was 2003. Three separate houses in Waukesha, Wisconsin had been vandalized. Words had been spray painted onto those houses and the cars. Potted plants had been knocked over. Tires had been slashed. Police soon figured out that these crimes had been committed by the same man, an individual named Matthew Munchau. Now, what had these people done to Matthew? Well, as it turned out, they hadn't done anything to him in a while. Matthew later explained to the police that he made a list of three people who had wronged him over the past ten years. He'd been waiting for years for just the right moment to get even. One of the victims was responsible for Munchau getting fired from a supermarket job ten years earlier. Another victim had stepped in to stop an argument he was having with someone. And the last individual simply cut him off in traffic ten years before. Munchau had gotten the addresses of these people and began to get his revenge. He kept a grudge, a long grudge, and decided to get even. This morning, we're going to talk about this idea of a grudge and what it leads to. We're in a three-week series in the book of Obadiah. I'll do a little review if you weren't here last week. Obadiah is an interesting book in the Old Testament. It's actually the shortest book in the Old Testament, just 21 verses. Obadiah is the name of a prophet who was called by God to speak on behalf of God to the people of Israel. And his message was essentially a warning about destruction to the people of Edom. Now, last week we learned that Edom or Edomites were descendants of a guy named Esau. You might remember the story of Jacob and Esau. Jacob and Esau were brothers. They were fraternal twins. And Jacob had done some things to double-cross Esau, and Esau had reacted a certain way, and it caused a division in their family. Now, eventually, Jacob and his descendants became known as the Israelites, and Esau and his descendants became known as the Edomites. And for 1,200 years, they warred against each other. They had a rift. They had a grudge. And for what reason? Well, we're going to see that in detail today. And also, I believe, we'll be able to pick up some principles that will help us live in harmony with each other. So, look on with me at Obadiah, verse 10, and let's track through this verse by verse. Verse 10 says, Because of the violence done to your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you, and you shall be cut off Forever. So when Obadiah says Jacob, he's talking about the nation of Israel. Now, we have to go back a little bit and gain some context on, on where this got started. And what I want you to do is save your place in Obadiah. But I want you to go to the book of Numbers, chapter 20. Numbers is close to the front of your Bible. It's a part of the Old Testament law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. And we'll look at chapter 20, and I just want to show you something that you'll find interesting. From verse 14 to verse 21. This is after Moses has led the Israelites out of Egypt, out of captivity, and they're on their way to the promised land. Now, they came to a place where they needed to pass through the land of Edom. So here we're talking about the Edomites descended from Esau. And this is what happens, verse 14. Moses sent messengers from Kadesh to the king of Edom. Thus says your brother Israel. Do you hear that? You see, they're, they're related. Their nations are related. They're sort of brother nations. You know all the hardship that we have met, how our fathers went down to Egypt. We lived in Egypt a long time, and the Egyptians dealt harshly with us and our fathers. And when we cried to the Lord, he heard our voice and sent an angel and brought us out of Egypt. So he's saying, you guys know what happened to us. We were were slaves in Egypt, right? You know we had a hard time. God called us out of Egypt, and here we are, basically on your doorstep. Verse 17, please let us pass through your land. We will not pass through field or vineyard or drink water from a well. 
We'll go along the king's highway. We won't turn aside to the right hand or to the left until we have passed through your territory. So what's he saying? Guys, we've had a rough time. This is, you know, we're, we're sort of related, right? Our nation and your nation. And all we want to do is walk through your land. And, and we're not going to touch anything. <laughs> you know, we're going to keep our kids in check. We're going to keep our animals in check. We're going to stay on the road. What's their response? Verse 18. But Edom said to him, you shall not pass through, lest I come out with the sword against you. So Edom says, no, you can't come through our land. And the people of Israel then replied, look at verse 19. Okay, we'll go up by the highway. And if we drink of your water and I and my livestock, then we're going to pay for it. Let me only pass through on foot, nothing more. So he's saying, okay, well, I know you're probably worried that, you know, there's a lot of people. So you're worried if we, if we damage anything, if we take anything, we're going to pay for it. Verse 20, but he said, you shall not pass through. Now listen to this. And Edom came out against them with a large army and with a strong force. Thus Edom refused to give Israel passage through his territory. So Israel turned away from him. You can see that this has been going on for a long, long time. It's a fascinating story and it's kind of heartbreaking. Not that many generations have passed at this point from the incident of Jacob and Esau. You know, it's maybe 400 years since that thing happened. Remember this too. Esau forgave Jacob. But the descendants of Esau continued to hold that grudge against all of the Israelites. Now, how hard would it have been for the king of Edom to say, I'll tell you what, I know you guys have had it rough. I get it. And by the way, our, our forefather, Esau, he, he forgave you. So go ahead, pass through, pass through. That would have been easy enough. He probably should have said, hey, by the way, what can we do to help? But he didn't. He said no, and then he sent an army. It got to the point where they wouldn't even help them when they were in trouble. And, and this led to a, it was like a multi-generational grudge. This feeling of superiority and self-sufficiency and pride, which will ultimately become their downfall. Now, it's interesting because Holding a grudge is something that I think we all need to be on guard for today because it's easy. It's easy to hold a grudge. Somebody might have said something to you a while ago and it hurt your feelings and you're holding on to that. You think about it on a regular basis. Somebody might have done something to you. Somebody might have wronged you in some way you know maybe it was a relationship thing maybe they stole your boyfriend or your girlfriend or maybe you know they uh, robbed you of an opportunity for a, a job or maybe they you know conned you out of some money and whatever it is you decided rather than to deal with that and to forgive them that you want to hold on to that grudge and it's dangerous it's dangerous to do that my new favorite quote about a grudge and this is so good Anne Lamott, the author, says, carrying a grudge, it's like drinking rat poison and waiting for the rat to die. Here's the truth. When you hold a grudge, you hurt yourself more than anyone else. The Edomites here had been holding a grudge for 12 centuries. Not just holding it, investing in it, allowing it to take over for their children and their children's children and their children's children's children. Do you understand? At some point, the kids, the grandkids, the great-grandkids, they don't even understand why they hate the Israelites, but they do. Someone recently asked me, what, what happens if I refuse to forgive? What happens if I refuse to forgive? Well... When you refuse to forgive, what you're doing is you're choosing bitterness. You're choosing to remain bitter. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 31 and 32 is a great reminder for all of us. It says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Now, here's the important part. As God in Christ forgave you. The truth is, we forgive others because God has forgiven 
us. Verse 11, let's continue. He says to the Edomites, on the day that you stood aloof, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth, speaking of Israel, and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them. Aloof here means far away. It's as if the Edomites watched all of this transpire from far away. Now, let me give you some interesting context here because this is a clue about when the book of Obadiah was written. About 600 years before Jesus was born, there was a guy named Nebuchadnezzar. He was the king of Babylon. The Babylonians came into the nation of Judah and they conquered the whole area, including Jerusalem. This is what Obadiah is talking about. He's saying that the Edomites witnessed the Babylonians come in and conquer Judah and destroy Jerusalem and do nothing about it. They washed it from a distance and did nothing about it. Now remember, these foreign invaders, invaders, these Babylonians came in, they captured the Israelites, they killed the men, they enslaved the women and the children. This is where the story of Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, you know those names? You know how Daniel was taken to Babylon with those guys? That's this moment right here. Edom, the brother nation of Israel, had an opportunity again to do something. The Bible says you stood aloft and you watched it happen. And in doing nothing, they were just as bad as the invaders. It reminds me of something called the duty to rescue law. I don't know if you've seen this. Some nations have what's called the duty to rescue law, which means if you see somebody being taken advantage of, being hurt, you see somebody who's in trouble, you have a duty. It's the law that you must help them. Now, interestingly enough, we don't have that in the United States. We have the Good Samaritan Law. The Good Samaritan Law is different. The Good Samaritan Law means if you do help them, you can't be held liable for your help. But in some countries, if you don't help somebody who's in trouble, you are just as guilty as the individual who's causing the trouble. To this day, Israel has a law passed on this. It's known as the do not stand idly by while your neighbor bleeds law. I don't know who named it. Actually, I do know. <laughs> it comes right out of the Bible. It comes right out of the book of Leviticus. Because in the Old Testament, God said, if you see your neighbor in trouble, you should do something. Now, what's cool is Jesus took this idea into the New Testament in a different way, right? He said this, how would you like to be treated? What if you were in trouble? What would you want someone to do for you? Well, you should do that for others. Some people think the golden rule, as it's called, is this. Do unto others as they do unto you. No, that's not what Jesus said at all. See, that's a reactive idea. Jesus had a proactive idea. It's in Luke chapter 6, verse 31. He says, and as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. That's a big idea, especially for believers. I want you to ask yourself this morning, what kind of world do you want to live in? Do you want to live in the kind of world where we watch out for each other? Or do you want to live in the kind of world where everyone is out for themselves. Think about it this way. If you want people to stop for you on the road if you're having car trouble, then you should be the kind of person who stops for other people on the road. You catching what I'm saying? If you would like it if people contact you and bring you meals when you're sick, let me ask you, are you doing that right now for somebody else? If you want people to reach out to you when you're having trouble, do you reach out to other people who are having trouble? It's funny, I've been at this church now for 18 years, and uh, one of the things I hear from people all the time, for example, is people will say, well, you know, we, weren't, we stopped coming to church for a little while, maybe because we were sick or we were traveling or whatever, and nobody called us. Nobody checked in on us. And 
What I want to say is, well, are you in the habit of regularly calling and checking in on people yourself? Because if you're not, that says something, isn't it? So the idea is simply this. What would we like people to do for us if we are in trouble? Well, then we need to be the kind of people who would do that for other people. The point of Obadiah is that the grudge against Israel has been going on so long, it's so ingrained, it's so cemented that they stood by and they watched the destruction of their sister nation. Not only that, they gloated about it. Look at verse 12, 13, and 14. He says, but do not gloat over the day of your brother in the day of his misfortune. Do not rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their ruin. Do not boast in the day of of their distress. What's gloating? Well, gloating is the celebration of somebody else's misfortune. Verse 13, do not enter the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Do not gloat over his disaster in the day of his calamity. This is not like gloating because your team beat another team in football. That's different. This is more like, I don't like that guy I'm glad he lost his job. I can't stand that girl. I'm glad she fell off her bike or whatever happened to her. He says, don't boast in the day of somebody else's distress. Don't take delight about that. It's funny because the Hebrew word for boast there literally means don't enlarge your mouth. That's a great picture. I'm going to be honest about it. COVID has brought some of the worst out in all of us when it comes to this. On one side, and I've seen this on the news and you probably have too, you'll say like, oh, this person who was against the vaccine or this person who was vaccine hesitant or whatever, they died. And there's a little bit of gloating in that from the one side. But the other side says, oh, yeah. Well, that person was vaccinated. They were fully vaccinated and they died. And there's a little gloating in that. Isn't that just the worst? That's just the worst in all of us? I'm going to be honest with you. I do this. Isn't it human nature? It's human nature to take some amount of pleasure in the failure of other people because in some way it feels like because they're struggling, maybe we're not. It's like if someone is down or experiencing misfortune, we feel a little bit better about ourselves. I can think back to some times when we were new as a church and just struggling as a church. And we would hear that something happened at another church, maybe some kind of conflict, maybe some kind of drama. And it led to the church sort of falling apart. And deep inside my heart, there was a little bit of gloating in there. And in in a large mouth to tell people, oh, did you hear about that other thing? We have to be careful about that. You never want to celebrate somebody else's struggle. You never want to celebrate or gloat about somebody else's challenge. What should you do instead? Jump in there and help out. How different would this passage be If the king of Edom at that that point said, we better do something. These are our brothers and sisters. Let's get down there. Let's stand in the way of the Babylonians. But they didn't. In later passages, you'll see that in some cases, they actually joined in as allies, the Babylonians. Now, as we continue in this passage, we're going to see this type of behavior lead to a complete destruction of Edom. To give you an example, are there any Edomites left today? No. Their destruction was complete. And we're going to learn about that. And we're going to see why that's important for us. We're going to do that next week as we continue this series. But let's just put some handles on this message for today. Thinking, what can we do? How can we change the way we live today? How can we leave this place a little different, motivated by something that the Word of God says? 
Here's the first thing I want to encourage you to do. Put down the grudge. Put down the grudge. I don't know what it is. But I know in a room this size, and I know when people are watching, there are people holding on to something. And they're letting it get to them. Another favorite quote of mine, I can't remember who said it, but it said, holding a grudge is like being stung to death by one beat. It's not doing you any good. Actually, I put something on Facebook last night. Someone responded. They said, don't put the grudge down. Lift it up and give it away. Jesus encourages you to do that. Actually, he encourages you to bring it to him. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. He says, come to me. All who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. It's almost like he's saying, come to me if you're tired of holding on to that grudge. God forgave you because of the sacrifice Jesus made. I want to help you take that grudge away. I will give you rest. Now, you might be thinking this morning, I could never forgive that person. I'm telling you, that's not true. You might be thinking this morning, I could never pass, move past the pain and hurt that I'm feeling. I'm telling you that you can. You might think this morning, there's no way I could ever heal and become whole again. I'm saying there is a way. Now, notice what I'm not saying. I'm not saying it will be easy. I'm not saying it will be quick. I'm saying it's possible. And I'm saying it's the best thing for you. Let me make one additional note about forgiveness and giving away this grudge. Forgiveness doesn't always mean a restored relationship. That's especially true in situations that might involve abuse. That might be true in relationships that are dangerous. Sometimes those relationships aren't restored. But forgiveness is what allows you to begin healing. It's the first part of setting down your grudge. Or giving it up to Jesus. Remember what Jesus said? And as you wish that others would do for you, do so to them. Let me ask you this last question. Do you want people to forgive you when you mess up? Do you want people to forgive you when you mess up? Well, then you have to be the kind of person who forgives others first. You might say, but they don't deserve my forgiveness. Well, either do you, either do I. None of us deserves God's forgiveness, but God gives it to us, and because he does, we're called to forgive others. If you're struggling and you need some help, if you need some prayer, if you need someone to talk to, text our prayer number here, it's 407 988-0991. Let's just put that up on the screen. We'll leave it there. I think it'll show up down here on the video. I'll leave that up for a little while. Jot this down. Put it in your phone. We have a prayer team here. We have a group of elders that would love to pray for you. Uh, If you indicate that you would like someone to reach out and talk to you, to encourage you, pray with you, text that number and we'll do that. Like I said... Putting your grudge down is not easy, but it's the right thing to do, and God can help you do that. Let's close in prayer. 